Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Seth and Audrey and CJ and Rigo and Data and Society and all of you uh, for having me and coming out. Uh, this is a real treat for me to get to talk about all of this stuff, uh, especially with this group. I see a lot of familiar faces and folks who I've learned a lot from, and I'm sure uh, I'll continue to learn a lot today, and I hope uh, you will too. So, um, you know, and uh, as I was on the flight over here uh, today, this morning, um, I was thinking about how it, how odd in some ways it is to be having this conversation, you know, in the shadow of the net neutrality repeal uh, at the FCC. Because um, in some ways, right, that if, you know, assuming that repeal goes through, that's uh, taking a step back at precisely the moment when we actually are already many layers behind in thinking about these concepts of neutrality, common carriage, private power. Uh, in a lot of ways, part of what's so messy about uh, thinking about internet power and informational power and platform power right now is that you have multiple types of concentrated power at play at the same time, right? The ISPs, the information platforms, uh, kind of the, the underlying algorithms and uh, stores of big data, and we're trying to make sense of all of these, uh, all of these things. So um, Seth mentioned a little bit about my previous work. Uh, I come at this a bit from a different angle, uh, thinking about the intellectual history of progressivism, the history of the regulatory state, theories of power and democracy. Um, and, uh, and I think what I'd like to present today is uh, a bit of a frame, a way of thinking about the problem of platform power and, and con concentrated control over information uh, that I think touches on and draws on a lot of different sort of areas that uh, a bunch of other great folks, right, in, in many in this room uh, have been working on. Uh, so uh, let me sketch that out and then we can kind of hopefully have a, a broader, uh, broader discussion. So, um, Part of what I think got me started on this uh, thought process is that in some ways, you know, we're, the messiness of this question of platform power uh, and, and control over information is that we are actually dealing with many crises at the same time, right? Uh, worries about disinformation, manipulation on online speech platforms, uh, questions about AI and algorithms and discrimination or uh, other types of mistreatment, uh, the privacy surveillance questions, uh, and then questions of market power and, and, pl and platform dominance. And what I want to suggest today is that one reason why we have all these uh, concerns at the same time is that they're all manifestations of a deeper problem, which is that we have a, uh, an informational infrastructure that exists outside of our normal uh, domain of regulation, checks and balances, governance. And so really what's going on here sort of underneath all of these uh, kind of surface level battles that we're fighting is a problem of private control over infrastructure, particularly in the domain of information uh, and how we think about and uh, respond to that. So, um, and part of why, why I think this is a, a thorny problem, right, is that uh, we have multiple layers of infrastructure at play at the same time uh, and it, raises a bunch of different questions about uh, competing moral values, principles that we want to apply to the to these types of private infrastructure, uh, invoking a range of governmental tools, uh, public and private actors. And so uh, my hope is by the end, we might try to impose some order on uh, all of this uh, kind of these different uh, questions that are at play. So uh, before I do that, let's um, think back a bit, uh, uh, 100, 100 plus uh, years, to what I, a bunch of historians in this space uh, have been surfacing around the public utility tradition. So um, think back to, say, 1850s, 1860s, 1870s, right up through to the 1920s. Now, in some ways, this is a little bit odd source, right, for thinking about the infra internet era. This is, um, in some ways, a stone age, right, of, uh, of technology relative to now. But I think it's enlightening because, in, uh, in a lot of ways, reformers of the turn of the 20th century we're thinking about a lot of these same problems around what happens when you have technological change that creates new forms of uh, new goods and services upon which the economy and society now suddenly depend, right? And these goods and services didn't exist before, so we didn't know how to regulate them. And, and now that they exist, they exist in private hands, but we all depend on it as the public. And so how do we deal with that, right? Um, and so that thought process, I think, is really analogous to what we're uh, thinking about today. So uh, in the progressive era, there's this broader uh, concern about this idea of private power. Uh, the, pro the corporation is now becoming this kind of vast, uh, powerful entity, right? Think the monopolies of the Vanderbilt or, you know, J.P. Morgan, the man, not the firm, uh, pulling the strings of the modern economy. 
and this broader concern in the progressive era about private power, I think, can be boiled down to two principles, two problems. Uh, first is a problem of domination. So domination is, this, is the idea that it doesn't matter whether uh, you happen to be well treated right now. What matters is uh, whether uh, you're subject to the arbitrary benevolence of another actor. Right, so Louis Brandeis is talking about the corporation and he says the corporation is a benevolent absolutism. Benevolent because it might treat you, happen to treat you well now, but if it changes its mind, it can completely change your life like that. Right, and so just because it's benevolent doesn't mean it's not absolutist. So it's a problem of domination and that related to that is a problem uh, that these types of private actors, private power, uh, they're not subject to the same types of checks and balances that we assume apply to the state. Right, so we have a whole constitutional structure of separation of powers, elections, uh, you know, kind of public advocacy, right, around restraining the power of the state. Uh, but we don't have the equivalent for these increasingly state-like private actors. And so a special subset of this broader worry in the progressive era around private power was the public utility. So uh, let me give a, a couple of examples. So. Um, uh, and the case, there's like all these great, one of the nice things about doing this as a, as, a, as a lawyer is you find all these great nuggets and all these ancient cases that um, are really uh, revealing. So um, here's one, uh, just by total example, there's, there are many others. Um, from Wisconsin in 1858, uh, the court is trying to figure out how to deal with the fact that the uh, gas, electric, gas and electric company can arbitrarily shut off access uh, from homes that you know, have, a, have a, a, a pipeline, right? And they didn't used to, it's not like people had this type of uh, electric wiring before, but now they do. And so now we need, um, uh, they're raising these, these disputes and they say, well, look, uh, the gas company has, a to has the right to impose whatever regulations and restrictions it wants. That's fine, it's a private company, uh, but it, it's not allowed to just do uh, any kinds of uh, regulations. Those regulations have to be reasonable, just, lawful, not capricious, arbitrary, oppressive. Uh, if they were, that would be leaving people at the mercy of the utility company, um, which might become careless, fraudulent, malignant. Right? This is that idea of benevolent absolutism. Right? It's good until it isn't. Uh, the other piece about this, though, is that um, this, this unchecked power is especially troubling because the, this, this service, gas and electric, is now suddenly a necessity. Even though it didn't exist before, it has now become something that you can't live without, right? So the successful operation of this gas company worked a radical change in the mode of lighting in the streets and dwellings and place of business, thereby creating a sort of necessity for the article. And so recognizing that even though this service didn't exist before, it, can, it has now acquired the status. It's acquired such importance that it now uh, raises these uh, types of moral concerns about checks and balances. Uh, here's another example, Mun v. Illinois, which is famous for uh, the kind of, con if there are any con law folks in the room, um, is famous for lots of other reasons, uh, but for our current purposes, uh, this was about regulation of uh, warehouses. Um, and what's interesting in this case is that the court frames the problem of warehouses as the gateway to commerce, and this is why they raise uh, unique regulatory challenges. I think it's particularly sort of telling going back if we're in light of something like Google or Amazon, which I'll get to uh, in a minute. So this worry about private control over the new infrastructure led to a whole bunch of uh, new institutional and governance regimes around things like railroads, telecom, telephony, uh, municipal utilities, right? The whole reason why you have Con Edison or the MTA uh, is precisely because the, of the effort to create public or quasi-public control over these uh, types of infrastructure. Uh, and then you see similar moves in other industries as well, milk, ice, water, basic, uh, basic goods. So that's the public utility tradition. What does that tell us about uh, informational infrastructure today? Um, uh, a couple of things. So first, I think this idea of public utility, we can kind of modernize it uh, as a way of thinking through new types of infrastructure. And I think there are really three conditions that come out of the history, but really track with our worries about firms like Google, Facebook, or Amazon. Uh, the first is scale, right? These are all operating uh, at scale. If they weren't operating at scale, we wouldn't have to worry about them quite so much, right? Uh, the second is this idea of downstream uses. So in, in a sort of traditional economistic way, we might define infrastructure in terms of uh, the modes of production, right? Is it 
um, is it a public good? Is it non-rival, non-excludable? Does that mean that the market undersupplies it? Right, that's sort of the economist's definition uh, of infrastructure. But here I'm highlighting the other side of it, which is sort of the demand side, right? It, what are the types of social, economic, political purposes that this new good or service enables, makes possible downstream, right? And to the extent that, that it enables more stuff that we value, it's more important. Uh, and then the third condition relates to the second is what I think of as vulnerability, right? So precisely because the good or service enables all these downstream uses and operates at such scale, uh, we are then vulnerable to who, the whims, the, 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 uh, the will of whoever governs and owns that service, right? Um, and so this is like the, the, the Wisconsin gas case, right? If they shut you off, you're really in a jam because you now need this thing and there aren't so ma too many other competitors that you can go to. So one thing to note here about infrastructure, this means that uh, we're getting to a social and political definition of infrastructure, not an economic one, right? This is a socially constructed idea of what counts as infrastructure and it's necessarily fluid. So something that's infrastructure today may not be infrastructure tomorrow. And something that isn't infrastructure today might become infrastructural tomorrow. Now that might make it messy, but I think that's exactly sort of where we are, right? We, uh, it's totally fair game, I think, to say that 10 years ago, search was not infrastructural for our economy, but now it seems that it very much is. And I think we need a, we need a way to sort of capture that fluidity. Um, okay, so one last piece uh, before we can get to the different uh, internet platforms and information platforms. So. Uh, in the gas and electric or the warehouse case or, or railroads, you know, all these 19th century uh, scenarios, private monopolistic control is in some ways easy to spot, right? You can, it, it's, uh, the boundaries are very clear. In, in the context of the internet, that's a little bit harder, right? Because power is in some sense diffused network decentralized. But what I think we're facing, right, is that in a diffused network decentralized digital economy, uh, we actually have other more subtle forms of concentration taking place. And that's where the digital infrastructure problem uh, arises. So uh, we can name a few of them. So one uh, is act, you know, actual control or monopoly. That's, I think, very uh, more straightforward. Uh, but I think a, a different form would be uh, firms, or, uh, uh, firms that serve a kind of gatekeeping function. So to me, this is like search. Uh, it's not that Google literally owns all the data on the internet. If it did, that would be sort of the first kind of problem, right? Actual control or monopoly. But the, the Google's power is because it is now the dominant critical gatekeeper through which most people access economic, social, and political uh, purposes on the internet. And that gatekeeping function makes it infrastructural in a way that feels more like the information utilities of the 19th century, even though they don't literally control the whole internet. Uh, another similar type of uh, concentration of power in a diffused, uh, seemingly decentralized uh, internet, I think comes out of uh, all the cons a lot of concerns a lot of folks uh, here and elsewhere have been writing about uh, around scoring power, right? This idea of uh, in indices and scores that accumulate a sort of outsized influence on uh, the life chances of individuals, say if it's like credit rating scores, right, or risk assessments for, um, uh, for bail or, or criminal justice. Um, you could think of other sort of uh, uh, economic scores that are also uh, infrastructural in the same way. So the credit rating agencies leading up to the financial crisis or the LIBOR scandal uh, or any one of a number of uh, kind of back, uh, kind of behind the scenes uh, in indexes that actually structure a lot of uh, economic activity. Um, and I think a fourth uh, type here is the kind of problem of background rules, algorithms, curation, right? So, um, and in some ways, that I think th these are not uh, mutually inconsistent, right? You could, and that's part of what I'm hoping with this diagnosis to kind of unpack, right? So something like Google uh, is actually all three of these, right? It's the gatekeeper function, it's the scoring function, uh, it's the algorithmic and curation function that are all at play at the same time. Uh, but I think it's important to sort of parse them out because we might well have different tools and responses to each of these. And they're all different forms of sort of infrastructural power that Google or Facebook uh, or Amazon have. Okay, so now how do we govern then information infrastructure having sort of defined it and diagnosed it? Uh, and I'll just kind of sketch out a little bit um, so we can have more time for, for discussion. Uh, but 
first is a couple of governance principles, uh, sort of substantive values that I think we want to get to. So uh, there's one set of values, which if you look at in the history and also sort of in a lot of the literature right now, that I think you can group under the rubric of provision. So we want to make sure people have access to the good. We want to prevent discrimination. We want to ensure common carriage, uh, fair pricing. These are all about making sure people can access that service that is so uh, infrastructural and basic and foundational. But then I think we have a second set of principles, which is about the flip side of that, uh, which is protection. So anti-fraud, prevention of uh, contamination of the service. So in the same way that you know, part of the purpose of the water utility, establishing the water utility in the 1800s, was to ensure that water wasn't tainted. Uh, and part of the purpose of having uh, regulation of milk, you know, there's like a ton of public utility cases about the production of milk, because like there was a time where the production of milk was like highly fraught, right? And uh, but for that regulation became you know, poisoned and contaminated and uh, kind of toyed around with in all sorts of ways that were like bad for people, right? Um, so there's an anti-contamination sort of uh, uh, idea. I think this sort of links up with some uh, of the literature around uh, treating uh, misinformation as nuisance, right? So Jack Balkin and others have been uh, writing about that. <clears throat> and this is where I would put privacy and consumer protection uh, principles, right? These are all about once you have access to the good, protecting the value, the service uh, of the good itself. So if th those are the principles and what are the tools, the institutions that uh, we might use. And this is where I think uh, we, we're sort of in the middle of a debate about what's the right institutional regime. Uh, so rather than kind of uh, solve that problem, I don't think I can, I can do that. Uh, again, let me give a, a bit of a mapping. So <coughs> uh, one set of debates I think is about different modes of administering those standards around provision and protection. And some of that might be directly through public regulation. Uh, I have some sympathy for that. Um, uh, I think there are some challenges here around just sheer regulatory capacity. There's a whole First Amendment problem uh, that we can get into. Uh, but I think there's, there's a lot to be said for that. Um, I think then another alternative is, is some debate about whether the, we can get the platforms to self-regulate. Uh, you could imagine sort of creation of uh, professional norms, uh, some kind of certification model, you know, like LEED certification for, uh, for green buildings, uh, consumer watchdogs and the like. Um, and again, I, I don't see these as mutually exclusive, right? In some ways, the threat of public regulation might well be what's needed to generate the right kinds of, uh, of private self-regulation. Uh, and, and, and there's precedent for all of this too, right? I don't think it's a coincidence that at the same time that sort of old media companies are becoming infrastructural in the early 20th century. That's when journalism becomes professionalized. That's when the FCC becomes uh, institutionalized. And that's when we get the first round of what is you know, now the basis for our net neutrality and common carriage debates, right? All of that is happening at the same time in some ways in response to the same sort of set of concerns about private control over infrastructure. You go back and you read a lot of the uh, telephony cases, right? The big worry, one of the big worries is, uh, you know, Gould is going to take over Western Union. And Gould also has all sorts of other business interests and political interests, and like that's a real problem. It's not unlike you know, worries about Facebook and Zuckerberg and, uh, uh, and fake news in the 2016 election. So these are about, but I think so this debate is not about what the principles are that we want to achieve through regulation. This debate is about the means, right? What are the instrumentalities that we need to build to get there? Uh, one last thing about governance tools. So uh, one of the things that comes out from the public utility idea and this idea of infrastructure, I think that is different from sort of just cutting straight to, say, trying to assure better privacy protections and the like, is that a lot of the history of public utility regulation uh, has this idea of what I think of as structural regulation, where the goal is actually to uh, change the incentives and even the business model of the firms that operate as infrastructural firms. And in a way, that say, that the, the goal is that that kind of saves you from having to do more of the case-by-case -case management and oversight. So think, so think about it another way. If, um, if it were just let, kind of to use a, 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 an example that's front of mind for a lot of us, right? If it were just less profitable to uh, market, to make money off of misinformation on an information platform, you wouldn't have to worry quite so much about content moderation at such a granular level, right? The part of the problem is that the business model is built or premised on 
a set of incentives that actually sort of drives some of the contamination that we uh, uh, see as a problem, right? And so, uh, so the public utility tradition kind of has a bunch of other tools that I think are important to bring back into the mix, which are structural, li changing the structure of the, inf of the firms themselves to try to shift their incentives so that they uh, just don't raise as many problems. And so uh, some of these are kind of classic antitrust remedies, right? If you uh, uh, kind of preventing mergers and breaking up firms that are operating on both sides of the line. So if you own the pipes, you can't also uh, be making money off of the stuff that flows through the pipes, right? Net neutrality is like the thinnest of thinnest versions of this idea. Um, but you could imagine much sort of sharper distinctions. Uh, between content production, say, and, and content uh, dissemination. And you can play that forward in a lot of uh, other, other contexts. Um, one thing that I'm toying with uh, now is just kind of throw it out there is, um, I think this might be an interesting way to think about privacy. So we usually think about privacy as a consumer protection thing, or it seems to me that we often frame it as such. But in some ways, uh, privacy as a prophylactic limit on what kinds of data can even be collected in the first place, uh, that's that done in that way, that strikes me as more of a structural kind of preventative move that takes a lot of the, the worries off the table. Because if you can't collect the data, you don't have to worry as much about how the data is used. Right? So that's privacy as prophylactic firewall, not privacy as sort of individualized consumer protection. And I think you kind of put it in this category that might open up some interesting uh, new ideas. And then a, a final sort of structural remedy here uh, is public options. So it's not a coincidence that a lot of these uh, early 19th, uh, kind of turn of the century, uh, public utility debates often involved uh, a question about should the government provide either exclusively or just as one option among many, a version, a plain vanilla version of, this, of the service, right? So it's not unlike the public option in healthcare debate. Um, in some ways, that's what ended up happening with, say, municipal transit. Uh, you have a public version, but then you have your, you know, plenty of private systems for getting around town. Um, I, I think this is particularly uh, potentially useful in some of the scoring and ratings contexts, right? So um, credit rating scores, uh, there, when Dodd-Frank was being debated, there was a, a brief attempt to, to nationalize, provide a, a plain vanilla public version of uh, the so kind of security scoring, right? The AAA scoring for, um, for securities. And that, that died, but I think that would have, you know, kind of, it fits in this category of, uh, of structural regulation. Uh, okay, so, um, to pull back out, I think there's three things I just want to make sure uh, I leave you with, right? Um, first is that I think we can get, gain a lot of traction by viewing informational uh, power and platform power in the internet economy today through this lens of infrastructure, right? Diagno using it as a way to diagnose where we see problematic concentrations of power and influence using these ideas of scale, downstream use, and vulnerability. Uh, then that opens up sort of this idea of the substantive principles that we want to uh, see achieved in these infrastructural contexts, right? Provision and protection. And then separate from that, uh, what instrumentalities we need to build to achieve those principles, right? Do we do it through public regulation, through private uh, self-governance, or through some kind of structural uh, restraint, you know, of the firewalling variety or public options or something else, right? So I think these are three dimensions on which we are, we are, uh, we're operating on all three of these dimensions at the same time, and that's part of why these debates can feel so messy. Um, and my hope is that by kind of parsing it out this way, that uh, can help us get a, a bit of clarity on where to go next. Um, but let me stop there, um, maybe toss back to, to Seth, and uh, we can have more of a, a conversation. Great. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, if you have questions, please raise your hand. I will bring you the mic. And it's super helpful if you can just say your name and like two words about where you are coming from <coughs> for Seville. I'm LaVon, and um, I'm an entrepreneur, but I, I work heavily in the area of personal data being used in credit scoring, mm -hmm. credit and risk analysis, and, and I've been deep in GDPR and specifically legitimate interest. And I'm yeah. wondering how you might frame the argument of legitimate interests as excuse, if you will, as related to infrastructure, which it had. Le legitimate interests of, uh, of, of who? So, the, so in GDPR, you know, uh, legitimate yeah, yeah, yeah. interest is an argument that presumably a credit bureau could make and say, right. we have the right to not let data subjects see their data or yeah. consent. Yeah, right. Can you make an infrastructure argument there? 
Yeah, so um, it, it's it's a great question. I mean, I'm I, I, I'm thinking a little bit off the off the top of my head, but um, so I think a lot of these infrastructural uh, viewed as infrastructure, one of the moves that I think it opens up is that there's kind of it, it, it sort of forces puts the business in a position of of having to make a choice, right? If your business model is such that you uh, that your your premise is that is is the goal is to become sort of the dominant purveyor of of a kind of infrastructure, right? In this case, a, a scoring regime that upon which lots of other people depend. Then if that's the business model, then fine, God bless, but then you are, uh, are subject to and obligated to a bunch of restraints and, uh, and restrictions. Um, and how we design those, you know, so I think you're, you're frame suggesting, you know, what about trans, you know, transparency to the consumer? Um, I think to my mind, you know, transparency would, would be would be helpful, but in some ways, uh, what would be better is some institutionalized process that allows someone to contest the score, challenge the score, update the score. And that might involve some kinds of transparency, but you could imagine ways of building that process that preserves some degree of, uh, 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 of opacity, at least around sort of the, the core business model. I mean, I think those are sort of context-specific judgments that we can make, but, but the basic sort of ch uh, uh, challenge, I think I would say, is that um, you know, if you if if the business model is to become infrastructural, then there are just certain things that you have to uh, accept as a consequence of that, right? And the, and that that's the that's a decision we make sort of collectively as as a society. Hi, Spiel. Hey, um, I'm Andrew Selbs, a postdoc here, Data Society. Um, thanks for this presentation. Uh, it was really really interesting. It was really great. Um, I, I particularly love the quotes from the old cases. Yeah, Those are fun, yeah. fun to see. Um, what strikes me about this, where I'm totally sympathetic to the idea, and it's a big picture idea, I can't see, can't see how we get there. Yeah. Um, a yeah. lot of what's blocking this yeah. idea from happening is, it seems to me, as a cultural issue rather than a legal mm -hmm. one. Um, and I can see it being coherent once we're there, mm -hmm. right? We, we agree infrastructure is the way we think about these things. That means we have changed what the yeah. First Amendment means, for yeah. example. Yeah. That means we have already done these things. But trying to get there piecemeal gets you arguments yeah. like them proposing in net neutrality saying, well, why are you regulating the ISPs differently mm -hmm. than the Googles? Yeah, totally. What piece do you start with? Yeah. How do you get us there? Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. And of course, you know, uh, uh, Andrew's been writing uh, some great stuff uh, about a lot of the stuff as a number of folks here ha have been as well. I mean, so, right, this is, this is kind of how do we get there kind of question. Um, and and I, I certainly struggle with this too. Um, I think maybe, so here's my intuition about it. Um, this, may not, this may not be right. Uh, but I do think that there's, there is something about, um, there's something about getting the, the diagnosis right that I think changes some of the politics uh, and, and sort of cultural valence around some of this stuff. So like, so um, it, it's almost like uh, by zooming out and situating say net neutrality or questions about fake news as a larger problem of private control over infrastructure, um, I think what, I, what I'm uh, hypothesizing or, or suggesting is that that, that move actually changes, opens up a lot more than, than sort of, and then makes possible more of the, the kind of individual turf battles that, that you described. And, and the reason I think that is just from my read of the, of, of the his, historical story, right? I think when you go back and you read those early cases, one of the things that's clear is that, yes, they're, they're kind of fighting individual policy fights about what to do about the gas company or what to do about um, uh, kind of the telegraph and Western Union. Uh, but it's also very clear that the the activists and lawyers and, and political groups at that time saw each of those fights very explicitly as part of a larger story about uh, essentially private government, right? We don't, kind of, we culturally do not trust unchecked power and arbitrary power, and that's like kind of baked into the American political tradition. Usually that manifests as an anti-statist kind of thing, uh, but I think we have a really rich sort of uh, uh, version of that that is all sort of deeply concerned about private infrastructure or private, private control over basic necessities, right? Um, why should we be subject to these other kinds of arbitrary will? And that, I think, opens up uh, more, more room to maneuver. Now, that may be wrong, 
uh, that's more of a kind of a cultural, as you say, um, or a kind of small p political um, proposal. But but that's at least my two cents. Hi, I'm Madeline Ellis. Thanks so much for your talk. Um, I am an anthropologist, and so we actually. As a discipline, we have a whole other set of definitions yeah. around infrastructure, which yeah. I'd love to continue sort of offline and read more about your paper. I guess yeah. my question, taking, <clears throat> taking your definition of, of infrastructure as you have posited it in this talk, I'm wondering if when you were sort of generating these ideas, if you found some places where the metaphor doesn't work, mm -hmm. and if you could talk about where those kind of failures are and what that might help us further understand. Yeah, right, right. Um, right, that's great. Um, so, so I guess I'd say a couple of things uh, about this. I mean, so one is just as, as a historical matter, right, there, it is true that the kind of tail, the, the second half of the public utility story, you know, I gave the first half. The second half is that after, after the Mun v. Illinois case, um, at least the, as a judicial legal matter, the courts kind of move away from the public utility idea, right? Because they, they, they kind of get frustrated with this attempt at trying to uh, draw the line between what industries are public utilities and which ones are just run of the mill regular industries. And so in a sense, that's, that's kind of, that's the outer bound, right? That's where at some point this, you know, this idea of scale, you know, uses, vulnerability just kind of breaks down and just becomes like regular, ordinary regulation. Um, and and I so I so I do think that's I do see that as, as in some sense a challenge, but but to me that's a challenge of application, not a challenge of that the idea is incorrect, right? That's just about do we apply it to how does it apply to different fact patterns? Um, the other thing I'll say too is that uh, uh, historically the move away from public utility uh, didn't mean that that we went back to uh, kind of laissez-faire, no regulation. Actually, what it meant was we created more generalized forms of regulation for those smaller scale types of businesses. So regular run of the mill consumer protection as opposed to sort of uh, the deep worry about the railroads, right? So, you know, mom and pop store down the street, we can regulate it now for all sorts of, you know, health and safety concerns, right? Um, but we're not worried that they're infrastructural. Uh, but, the, but that ability to regulate, you know, only came up after this public utility idea sort of bust open the laissez-faire libertarian sort of uh, 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 resistance in, the, in that early turn of the century. And so um, that's the other reason why I kind of like the, this as a sort of source of material, right? In some ways, uh, we are at a moment now with regards to internet regulation and information regulation where we're having to grapple with uh, what, what I think for some might have seemed like a, uh, a kind of self-regulating, self-governing system that uh, one of whose virtues was that it didn't need to be governed. Um, and now we're realizing that just like any other space, it actually does, it's already being governed. It's not a choice of governance or not governance. It's governance by whom, right? And, and just do you prefer governance by Google, Facebook, Amazon, or, you know, Experian versus governance by some other kind of public process? Um, so, so I don't think it, it, it applies to everything. And I don't think it will apply kind of forever. But I think there's a moment where we're where it's particularly apt, and and we're in one of those moments. Hi, uh, my name is Gustav Kalm. I'm also an anthropologist and lawyer. Uh, now I would actually like to ask, in some ways, the reverse uh, question uh, about this concept. And I was wondering if you look at those three main categories that you come up that <coughs> define infrastructure on that screen, then it seems that it's not only matters of internet, and I know we're mm -hmm. here in data and society, but mm -hmm. I would be inclined to, if one would take this uh, yeah. as a proposition of political theory, then to think then how or why should one or could not one use this as, a, as an analytic tool to think of, say, global value chains as a, as a source which could, which could or should give rise to certain political communities and yeah. different ways of decision making, because it would join many of those categories yeah. that you have there. Yeah, yeah, no, that's good. So, so um, in some ways, you're you're picking up on kind of my own route to this. So, the first paper that I wrote about this was only partially about uh, the internet and information platforms, and it was actually about the public this public utility infrastructure idea as a generalized way of thinking about 
regulation of private power. And so uh, in that paper, I think the link is on the, the page, uh, the page for the event. But in that paper, I was comparing uh, too big to fail financial regulation, net neutrality. And then I had like five pages on Google, Facebook, Uber, Airbnb, Amazon. Uh, and this was written like two years ago. And then of course, like now that, that those last five pages is, what, is kind of like where all the, like so much concern is now. And so that's kind of led to this more kind of directed uh, project. But, but I agree. I mean, I think that uh, part of what attracts me as, as a kind of history of political thought, political theory, public law person is, this, is the portability of this idea of infrastructure as a way of diagnosing forms of private power. Hi, I'm Mar um, Mariah. I'm with the Partnership for Working Families. I'm a researcher and organizer. Um, so I'm curious if this this made me think about um, the relationship between, as someone said, sort of the metaphor and traditional infrastructure, because they're increasingly connected or blurred. Amazon, right, is building a giant <coughs> network of warehouses and building an infrastructure or a team of of so-called independent drivers that provide same-day delivery. Yeah. Uber's you know, moving into trans public transportation, collecting tons of data that will inform that. Um, you know, there we have cameras on public streets. There's the Internet of Things that I'm sure is like becoming part of our built infrastructure, and I don't even know it. Um, Self-driving cars, etc. So there's a lot of relationship here, and so. And then I was also thinking about how, you know, one impact of neoliberalism is that that infrastructure is being pushed towards the private sector and out of public control. And so I'm curious if you've spent some time thinking about yeah. this relationship and the challenges and opportunities therein. Yeah, no, that's great. And um, uh, good to see you, Mariah. Um, so uh, totally agree. I mean, I think um, I, I think I alluded to this a little bit at the beginning. This, uh, like, uh, the interaction that you allude, you kind of describe between sort of informational infrastructure and like physical offline infrastructure and, and increasing relationship between them. I think that's totally right. And I think um, part of what's so uh, uniquely troubling about companies like Amazon, right, is that they're actually uh, uh, establishing private control over multiple types of infrastructure, each of which uh, has this outsized influence on our social, economic, and political life in multiple domains, right? So it's the physical control of retail infrastructure and delivery and logistics. It's also the virtual control over, you know, the marketplace, right? Amazon as gateway in terms of Amazon's uh, search function. Um, Amazon's cloud services, right, is sort of increasingly sort of uh, in many ways behind, well, well, for this group, not behind closed doors, but for a lot of other folks and not aware of uh, how much control Amazon has now over sort of the data uh, uh, infrastructure, right? So it's <clears throat> so actually multiple types of infrastructure all in the same hands uh, at once. And so so in, so in to my mind, that just makes it, it, it's sort of why this infrastructural way I find it helpful because it's sort of a triple quadruple threat, right? So, you know, the progressive era, they had to worry about JP Morgan cutting deals with the Vanderbilts, right? So you were worried about the financial infrastructure and the railroad infrastructure. Here, there's no deal. There's one company that runs the retail system, that runs the data system, and that runs one of the biggest sort of uh, information portal gateways of our digital economy, right? That's one company. And, and Google is, you can make the same arguments about Google and Alphabet, right? And these are companies whose, whose sort of stated, uh, stated intention is to dominate the entire social, economic, political system, to be in, like, it's in their mission statements, right? To become the new infrastructure, Amazon A to Z. Facebook describes itself, I think, I forget when exactly they, they put this in their homepage, right, as a social utility. And assuredly, Zuckerberg did not have all this in his mind when he did that, but it's telling, right? That the whole idea is that we will become the thing that everyone uses, the gateway that everyone uses, and that's our model. And so I think it just, it just kind of highlights how we need to be extra um, on alert, right, about the, the, the concentration of private control. And so then that gets to your second part of your question, right, that um, it's this private governance piece that really gets all of this going, right? If, they, if, uh, if Google, Facebook, Amazon were subject to the same checks and balances that we expect of, you know, formal public entities, then, you know, maybe it's not as troubling, right? But they're not, and that's part of the problem. Hi, I'm Robin Kaplan. I work for Data and Society. Great. Um, I want you to continue that a little bit. So yeah. 
When we're using the metaphor of infrastructure and we have these companies that are operating in many different spaces at once and can often change the spaces that yeah. they're working in very quickly, yeah. um, what, are, what are the implications for the infrastructure argument? Will we first have to then relocate each part of the business model back into domains and create some walls? Yeah. Or could we consider these companies kind of in their totality? Because often, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. data being gathered from one part of the company is being used to to um, deliver services in another part of the company. Yeah, no, that that's great, and I think um, so. So you know, in, in early versions of this project, I was initially thinking about these types of firms in in their silos, right? So the retail function or the logistics function. Um, but of course, but as you say, there there's something about uh, part of what's what's troubling is that they can cross leverage, right? Dominance in one domain in t to translate into another domain, right? And that's that's part of what allows them to sort of be so nimble and expansive. Um, so to me, that's, that's why this last bit of structural regulations really comes to the fore as an important set of policy tools. So, you know, I, I, would, I would probably be on the side of biting the bullet and imposing, you know, kind of antitrust style limits that you actually can't, we're, we will break up these firms, right? If you want to be, you know, the, the dominant retail platform, a, you have to then you be subject to common carriage and other types of non-discrimination rules, but B, you can't then also try to be the dominant data platform, right? Um, you can't do both of those things under the same corporate structure. And we'll just break it up. And, and this is sort of classic antitrust, right? So in some ways we're, you know, this is, this is part of a, partly a problem of our own making, right? Uh, we could have cut, nipped a lot of this in the bud with more aggressive antitrust enforcement, so I've written elsewhere about, about that as an important piece of this story. Um, so, so that's that's the first answer. I think the second answer, or one implication of that, right, is that uh, there will be uh, economic losses that come with that, right? That means that certain types of innovation don't happen, and certain types of economic activity don't happen. And so, I don't want to hide the ball on that. I think that's real. I'm, but I'm just saying that that's a bullet we bite, right? And that's a, that we just we make that trade because we're worried about this level of dominance. Now, it's per now, you might say that I don't want to make the trade, right? I think the upside is still great and good enough that we should just let it roll. Um, and up till now, that's kind of where we've been policy-wise. Um, but that's a, that's a debate we can have um, about is the upside good enough to warrant sort of unchecked private control. But let's not kid ourselves about the kind of infrastructural control that we're dealing with. Hi, my name is Chansey Fleet. I'm at the New York Public Library. I'm a technology educator, um, and I predominantly work with individuals with disabilities. So I'm trying to grapple with this definition of things that we might want to regulate as, as utilities, and thinking of like scale, and then downstream afford affordances, and that quality that you can't live without something. Um, once it's been introduced. And I'm thinking about marginalized communities. So specifically, I'm really interested right now in visual interpreter services, which are kind of like interpreters for the deaf, but they're interpreters for visual information. And I'm wondering what you think about the situation when within a small community, something is <coughs> at scale and has all kinds of downstream implications and has become indispensable, yeah. um, but it's not at global scale because it's so specialized to the, that community. I'm trying to think of another example that's not all about like me and my life and my community, and all I can think of is bicycles. You can probably think of a better one, but like, how do we handle that, and while, how do we handle probable pushback from corporations that like, hey, we're little guys, we can't handle that level of of uh, regulation, like that's not fair to us. We're not Amazon, we're not Facebook. Right, right, that's great. So, um, uh, I mean, essentially what you're describing, right, is that uh, the problem of disparities in power uh, is scalar, right? It can be at sort of a macro scale or it can be localized within particular spaces or communities. Um, I, I think that, uh, I, I think that, and a response to that is that, so in, in the more localized context, you still need some type of uh, regulation to balance out the disparity of power, uh, but it might be different regulation. So it's not, it may not be something like common carriage or antitrust uh, 
sort of limits on what, what those firms look like, but some other type of, you know, either like kind of more traditional type consumer protection, equal access types of regulations, which we do all the time. Um, and sort of, we have all sorts of regulations to remedy disparities of bargaining power between service providers and consumers as a general matter. Um, and uh, one of the quotes that I, I didn't put up here is uh, one of the kind of early public utility theorists is this guy, Bruce Wyman. Um, and he has this uh, argument, or he has this example where he talks about the innkeeper. And so you know, the whole idea of common carriage in the history of common law comes up out of uh, this idea of uh, travelers needing access to uh, roadways, transit ways, uh, and also inns when they travel. And he's got this riff in, in his, like he's like, it's this multi-volume work about the history of, about the public utility. It's literally like 100 volumes. And, but he's got this riff in there uh, about uh, innkeepers. And he says, look, if you are a weary traveler coming in at dusk and an innkeeper turns you away, the nearest inn is, a, is, a, is like 20 miles away. You can't get there and, and it's, it's dark and it's dangerous. Like you, you're, in a, you're in a pickle, right? And the innkeeper has to serve you because if they don't, the, the consequences are too severe. Right? And so it's super localized, right? It's just one innkeeper and one traveler. But what he's getting at is that there's a disparity of power that is, even though it's localized, is really problematic for that traveler. And so that is enough to warrant some type of regulation. Now, the regulation, what kind of regulation, I think the difference is that the innkeeper is not Amazon. Um, and so what that means is that the regulation we impose on the innkeeper is different from the regulation we impose on Amazon. Uh, but they, they both require regulation because they both have this disparity of power. Um, so it's not a total answer to your question, but I, I think sort of there's a spectrum of, of, uh, of scale, right, that would uh, change the types of regulations that, that you would apply. Yeah. Yeah. All right, I think we've got time for one more. <laughs> Hi, I'm Geneva Overholzer. I'm a senior fellow with the Democracy Fund and a longtime journalist. Um, I, I sort of hark back to a previous question about how might we get there. And I agree with you that uh, a proper diagnosis can shift the debate. Um, but what about, and this one may be too naive an idea, given the business models, but w what about the current challenges that these platforms are, are facing in terms of we don't know how the hell to respond to the Russian hacking and to the... Um, fake news, viral deception, um, and also the legal <coughs> challenges in other societies, particularly Western Europe. You mentioned that there could be self-regulation as a response to threatened public regu regulation, but my, uh, we sort of read these things now about people being troubled within you know, Facebook, et cetera, about what, what they've created. Is there something there um, that might help it begin, or is that ridiculously hopeful? Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I, maybe I share some of your uh, hopefulness. I'm an optimist at heart. Um, I mean, I think, so I do think we're in, we're in interesting and important uh, inflection point or potential inflection point right now, right? Because the, the sort of barrage of crises facing the firms themselves, I think really does have them on the back foot. So for the first time since their existence, I think all of these uh, uh, kind of dominant platform companies, Amazon, Google, Facebook, uh, at the top of the list, are now suddenly no longer sort of the poster children of the new economy, right? They're not, they, they, they're no longer sort of like, it used to be they could do no wrong, right? And now suddenly there's like a little bit of chink in that armor. Now, that doesn't mean that they're going to sort of go away, but it does mean that they, they are having to grapple with the fact that they're going to have to change something. And I think they genuinely do not know what to do, right? Um, and so in some ways that's the opening for this type of conversation, right? Um, you need to have this dialogue with folks in, the, in that space, right, in order to sort of get something out of it. Um, and so, so I could see it going in a, in a positive direction. It also could be a blip and, and, and nothing changes. But, but I do think like 2017 is very different from even 2015 in this regard. So that's, I think, hopeful. Great. So um, that's it. <laughs>